discussion on uh, digging into development uh, and we're also going to hear a bit about environmental issues. Um, I'm just briefly going to introduce this panel. Well, first I'm supposed to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Maan Saba. I'm a Norwegian journalist. Um, and I work on development and African issues. Um, the panel here today, first we have Toyosi Ugunsheye from Nigeria. Uh, she works with the Sunday Punch. She's an editor. Um, we also have Mark Shapiro from the Food and Environment Reporting Network, Network yeah. <laughs> Um, Shapiro has done quite a lot of work on environmental issues and uh, recently made a book on seeds. Uh, and last we have um, Raul Sanchez from Spain. He works with El Diario dot S. <laughs> uh, and he's done a wonderful series on, on uh, plantation economy in Africa and Latin America. So first, Toyosi, please. Hello everyone. Um, in the next 15 minutes, I'll be sharing some of the ways we do developmental journalism at Punch Newspaper. Punch Newspaper is Nigeria's biggest and most widely circulated newspaper. Now, this few tips I'll be sharing may not be new, um, but they've proven over time to work for us. And whether it's health reporting, environmental reporting, financial reporting, I think that these tips just work for um, whatever kind of reporting we do. The photograph you see there it was taken by one of the reporters I work with, and he went to this rural area in the north to do a story on water scarcity, and he discovered that there was this particular village where the kids and their parents had to share the same water stream with the cows as you can see in that photo. And I'll be delving into how we got about that story because I do not think it's exclusive to Nigeria. I think in most of the communities and countries we come from, we have disadvantaged communities like this. Why do development stories matter? Development stories matter, as we all know, for positive change, awareness and public debate, accountability, justice, social and economic reforms, and of course, improved healthcare. So how do we source for development stories? The first thing I ask myself every morning is what are Nigerians talking about? What are our readers talking about? And how do we know what people are talking about? Social media um, is a very effective tool of finding development stories, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. It's amazing how citizen journalists take pictures of um, a particular incident and they just post it on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. And it's a fantastic way of getting development stories. Another way is through comment section of newspaper articles. I love reading the comment section of stories because people just drop tips about even bigger stories or a follow-up story. So I think that the comment section is also very viable to get in development stories. Blogs, 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 blogs. Blogs are very big in my country, Nigeria. And you find that a lot of people find it easier to talk to bloggers, I don't know why, than traditional journalists. And so you find that sometimes you'd find very good development, um, development stories on blogs. Radio and television, particularly call-in programs, I don't know if you're very familiar with this, where people call to talk about the problem in their um, particular region, oh, this road is bad, we don't have electricity here, the water isn't working. So I think that radio and television is a very good way of getting um, development stories, especially call-in programs. Also statistics. For me, that's very huge. And how do I mean statistics? Statistics from WU, UNICEF, or even from um, local authorities. For example, one of the stories we did last year um, was just a five, it, it was sourced from a five paragraph statistics. So the HIV AIDS, um, the, the agency in charge of the monitoring of HIV AIDS in my country released this statistics for the year saying that in Nasarawa state, there was seen an increase in the ratio of transmission 
from mother to child. And the question is, why is this happening in Nasara? Nigeria is a big country, almost 200 million people, 36 states. So why is one state number one? And that gave us a very big story. So statistics, I mean, the World Health Organization will come up tomorrow to say polio is still very prevalent in Nigeria. Nigeria is the only country um, that's still battling with polio. So you want to ask yourself, why do we still have polio? Why is it that every other country has been able to eradicate polio? And that's a fantastic development story. Now, I'm using Nigeria as an example because that's what I'm very familiar with. But I'm sure that we can relate with some of these things because we all have statistics in our countries. So I think that to do very good development stories. We need to pay attention to statistics all the time. The stories are in the numbers. Also newspaper articles, follow-up stories are very, are very useful in um, telling development stories. Also related to the HIV story, which I'll be sharing um, very soon. Um, the state government released a small press, the state government of Nasara, the same state, issued a small press statement, just three paragraphs, saying they were going to clamp down on local surgeons. So in that state, we, we have people that local surgeons go about doing maybe tooth surgery for people and all that. And the, the state government said, look, these guys are responsible for why we have a high rate of HIV AIDS in our, in, our, in our state. And it was just a three paragraph statement. And we said, look, we need to look into this practice. It's obvious that the reason why this state has a high HIV AIDS rate is because of what the government is saying. So when we pay attention to what um, our readers or citizens are saying on social media, when we pay attention to comment section of newspaper articles, blogs, radio, television, calling programs, statistics, numbers, numbers and data, um, and also newspaper articles, I think we're gonna get fantastic development stories from this. And this is a story we did from um, one of, yeah, we got this particular story from a newspaper article, just five paragraphs, and it's a story titled Agent of AIDS, how Nasara's native surgeons spread HIV without knowing. Now, there was no way we would have known about these native surgeons because, as I said, Nigeria is very big. My newspaper is based in Lagos. Most of the reporters are in Lagos. But just because of that little statement from the state government, we got this fantastic story. We didn't even know that this practice was very widespread where local surgeons go about. And that's a picture of some of the local surgeons on the street going about with unsterilized equipment performing um, um, surgeries on people. And when they do the first surgery, they don't sterilize properly, they go to the next person. And um, it was one of the reasons why HIV was spreading in the state. So this is a good example of how we can do development stories from even newspaper articles. Another example is Kano. Diarrhea killing 14,000 children a year as cows, people share same water sources. Now, this story was gotten from statistics here. Yeah. I recall that um, I think it was the federal government that released a particular figure saying that children were still dying from drinking poor water and that Kano had the highest rate. And the question we asked ourselves in the newsroom was why Kano? Why Kano? Why should Kano have the highest rate in Nigeria? And then we sent a correspondent there, and um, it went to different communities in Kano, and realized that, and this is just representative of what was happening in the rural areas, where citizens and cows and animals were sharing the same water sources. And this is what those people have had to live with, with so many years that nobody knew about, nobody was reporting, because this is a very far, um, region. Also, we have language barriers. We have security issues with Boko Haram. So ordinarily, these are not things that are exposed um, to, to public knowledge. But because of that particular statistics from the government saying this particular state had a problem, we went in there and we were able to do the story. But what do I think is the most effective way of telling development stories? What has worked for the punt over and over again? And it is so simple. Pictures. Pictures, pictures, pictures. You know that when we talk about development stories, the first thing that comes to our minds, we think about oh, where am I going to get the money from? Um, where am I going to get the resources from? Sometimes just one picture 
would tell the story of 5,000 words. And at the point we have a policy, a front page policy, where we use only development pictures on the front page. Only development pictures on the front page. Yeah. So every day when you buy the punch, and these are just examples, that's Saturday punch, that's Sunday punch, we just take a picture, a development picture, and put it on the front page. You know what this does? It gets you quicker results than even 10,000 words. It gets you, because government is embarrassed when they see this kind of thing on the front page, so they get to act. Whoever is in charge of whatever mess it is that we are putting on the front page, we act immediately because the all of Nigeria is saying it. people are tweeting, they're taking pictures, they're tweeting it on Facebook, and people are saying, why is this happening? So I think that what is very critical in telling development stories is the power of pictures. And not just using pictures inside, but using it prominently in such a way that um, it gets the attention of whoever we want to find a solution to what we are talking about. And I don't know if it would be possible for you to adapt or adopt this of telling development stories on your front page, but I found it to be very effective. We do not use event pictures. Most papers would take a picture of an event and put it on the front page. No, every day there's a development photograph on the front page. And this has saved us a lot of time. This has saved us a lot of resources because we don't have all the money to send reporters all over Nigeria to do big development stories. Um, we don't have all the funds, but a picture, just sending a photograph out there sometimes could just um, perform the magic. So that's the picture. The first one is a picture of a secondary, a primary school. And you can see the pupils outside because the, 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 the classroom wasn't conducive. And right in front of the school, there's a big refuse dump. So two problems, two problems. Feel the environment and lack of facilities in the school. And I could think about 10 different stories I could write from this scenario. 10 different stories I could write from this. And that's one picture that solved the problem because immediately we published this picture on the Saturday. By Monday morning, new chairs were delivered and that refuse was cleared. The second one um, is another picture of a community that lives on water in Lagos. And there had been so many stories about um, the poor state of this community. Government wanted to fill the area, sell it to the rich. But these people get their livelihood from the water and nobody was taking their livelihood into consideration. And we decided to just tell the story with one picture and it worked. There are more examples. That's another one. On that front page is a very big market. The first picture here, that's a big market with a refuse dump in it. And in this market, people buy food stuff, people buy all sorts. And the, the um, agency in charge of cleaning the environment had refused to do anything about it. We had written so many stories and nothing was coming out of it. They weren't listening. And so we decided to embarrass them with the front page picture, and it worked. I mean, that's a development story. And under 24 hours, that was the state, that's it. The second picture, we used the following day, and you had cleared everything. And then you'd ask, do we have to use this picture on the front page to get you to do what you wanted, to, what you were supposed to do? Why am I using these examples? Development stories are everyday stories. Development stories are stories that affect citizens. So it could be from health to education, whatever it is. I want us to start looking at development stories with the eyes of pictures. Pictures, pictures, pictures. And it would achieve results. What are the problems with doing development stories? Funds. I mean, one of the reasons why we're here is to talk about funding for investigative journalism, funding for development um, journalism. That's one major problem. On cooperative sources, you know, it baffles me as a reporter sometimes when I want to do development stories and the people I want to do the stories for are not willing to talk to me. And I, and I just think about it. You really need the story. Why are you not talking? Um, on, on, cooperative, on cooperative editors, that's another problem. Yeah, I know, I can see people shaking their heads here, nodding their heads here. You want to do this development story and your editor isn't interested. Please give me the politics story, give me the business story. I'm not interested in that. How do you solve that problem? Conflicts and crisis. If you're from a very big country like mine, um, where we have pockets of crisis in some areas and these development stories are there, how do you um, 
deal with that challenge of conflict and crisis. Another thing is time. Not all development stories are easy to do in a short while. Not all development stories can be um, covered by just taking a simple picture. Some of them are really complex, they need a lot of time, and you don't have that time and you want to tell the story, how do you deal with that? I came up with a few um, solutions. They're not perfect, um, they are not conclusive, but these are some of the solutions that have worked for us at the punch. Yeah, the first one grants. Um, one of the solutions to funding problems in the newsroom is grants. But I find again that access to grants, as I said in the previous session, is another big problem. So these grants are there. How do you access them? Again, you just have to research and research and research. Sometimes I just go on Google and I just write grants for education, grants for, you know, just random things, and then I just go through it. So I think we'd have to apply ourselves as reporters to find these grants, because sometimes these grants don't come to us, we'll have to go to them. The solution for uncooperative sources, again, using local reporters, do you want to find, if you're trying to tell a story in a particular area, a development story, and they're not cooperative, what works sometimes is finding reporters in that area, they're very familiar with the people, and see if they can help you. Um, especially when there's language barrier, when there's religious barrier, when there's ethnic barrier, using local reporters could also work. Thirdly, the solution to uncooperative editors, I put uncooperative editors in court, um, is giving the story a human face. I find that in this age of data, in this age of statistics, sometimes our stories could be so loaded with data and statistics that your editor knows it's a good story, but is wondering how is this useful to my readers? And I think a good solution is giving the story human face. How does it affect your readers? Don't forget that the very first question I mentioned um, in slide four was what are people talking about? What do Nigerians want to know? What do Brazilians want to know? What do Kenyans want to know? What are Ghanaians talking about? What are South Africans talking about? How does it affect your daily life? I think that the key to convincing your editors to support your development stories or to publish your development stories is to give them a human face. And how do you give them a human face? Just ask yourself, how does this affect the average South African? How does this affect the average Nigerian? Once you can find an answer to how that story affects the lives or affects the life of the average citizen, then you found a solution to that, to that story. So no matter how data-driven your development story is, giving it a human face would and is likely to convince your editor. The solution to conflict and crisis, um, you may want to, another thing that works is talking to the police, the military, and getting paramilitary support. So sometimes when we send reporters to areas that are very volatile, um, we try to talk to the police and military to say, look, you may not be able to support this person, but we're informing you that this reporter is here, and we appreciate whatever support you can give him or her. Lastly, time. Time, what's the solution to time? I'll say killing. Um, if there's a very big story in, a, in an area I can reach, what I ask myself is what can I do in my locality? Can I, can I scale the story down? So scaling also works. So once you scale your development, for example, um, this story about, um, yeah, the refuse dumps, it's all over Nigeria, and I could sit down and ask myself, how am I going to do the story, it's so big. But just concentrating on a particular location and by scaling it down could um, achieve an objective. It may not solve the whole problem, it may not tell the whole story, but at least you get to push something out. I think that's about it on how you can dig for de development stories and tell them better. Thank you. Thank you, Tayozi. Um, Mark. Thank you. Um, fantastic to hear this tale about how you tell development stories on a kind of the ground level in Nigeria. And um, also, I got to say, I come from, I came from here from California, and I've been involved with this global investigative network for a, a long time. And it's just like thrilling to see this entire world <laughs> descended on Johannesburg and everybody with ideas and the amazing kind of exchanges. And anyway, it's an honor to be here. Thank you, and um, I think I want to talk about, I'm going to go, This hopefully this will kind of fit uh, in a, a bit with what Toyosu was talking about because um, 
I kind of want to go to the kind of big meta methodological uh, question of how you approach development um, stories. Because I, I also teach at the UC Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism, so I've been actually trying to think of what's at the heart of environmental reporting. And um, to do that, I've, I've tried to go to actually to the roots of science, because actually all of you who have some knowledge of environment are actually reporting on the scientific information that you are becoming aware of. You are, whether you know it or not, science journalists, science trying to understand the science of environmental degradation. And we also, as um, investigative reporters, like to think of ourselves as pursuing the scientific method, which I'm sure everybody's pretty familiar with this idea of how we approach a story from a scientific method point of view. We have a hypothesis, we test out our hypothesis, we challenge our own hypothesis, and we pr uh, proceed step by step. And um, I think one interesting way to think about stories, and this applies, I think, across the entire world, you know, whether you're in Nigeria or in Spain or in Tunisia or in New South Africa or in the United States or in China, this basic idea um, uh, reigns. And that is that actually when we go after a story, we are actually going after, we are trying to probe into a paradigm. So when we talk about development, agricultural development, let's, let's just k stick with agricultural development um, for a minute. Um, we are basically either accepting or questioning the existing paradigm that exists. Have, if people here, or some people might have some background in science and might know a, an amazing scientific philosopher um, named Thomas Kuhn, K-U-H-N, who, um, who has an entire theory about how scientists go about challenging a paradigm, right? There's an amazing book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And it's about actually the revolution through science over 200 years and how our understanding from one period of science changed in another period of science as the evidence accumulated over time. And um, I like to think of us journalists as basically being the, um, the, the journalistic equivalent of a scientist looking and examining and probing into the paradigms that are sort of are the organizing principle of our time because out of every paradigm comes very important decisions about society that society makes about the allocation of, it, of its resources. So um, major decisions follow a paradigm. Yeah. Let, me, let me just tell you quickly, my, this previous book I did is called The End of Stationarity, and um, it went after this essential paradigm which is more <laughs> lively in the United States than it is in uh, the rest of the world, unfortunately, which is essentially the, fact, the, the, the assumption that by uh, pursuing uh, responses to climate change is going to be more expensive and a more of a burden of society than the status quo. And you begin to, to look into that uh, uh, ultimate understanding and you begin to puncture it and realize the incredible amount of expense it is to actually maintain the status quo under extremely environmentally stressed conditions. So the next thing I did after doing this book was to begin looking into the world seeds, which is what I'm uh, in the middle of now, uh, uh, um, diving deep into the question of seeds. And let me ask you what you think the overarching paradigm is when it comes to agricultural development. Well, <laughs> the overarching paradigm, if I can say, is essentially that, um, that the central problem in the world is that the world does not produce enough food. That there are like so many people, there's you know, 10 billion people now, 11 billion, we're growing very rapidly, but the food resources of the planet are not capable at this point to support that many people, so we have this real challenge on our hands. This is the underlying paradigm that actually underlies agricultural development strategies, right? So first, first, uh, first um, challenge in dealing with this, with this topic of agricultural development is number one, identify the paradigm. So if that's the paradigm, then let's go about figuring out number one, whether it's true, and um, if it's true, report within a context that's provided by the paradigm. And if we can find ways to challenge that paradigm and actually probe into the underlying assumptions that lie beneath it, that's also part of our job. So I would say actually that, um, that, 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 and 
So number one, uh, very important to kind of identify the paradigm, give it a name, give it a word. When you go into a story, whatever it is, and it may be in the, um, uh, in the urban context of, uh, of a Nigerian city, uh, it may be in Spanish agriculture, maybe whatever the, the system is you're going at, get at the fundamental, what is the presumption that underlies it and is, is it correct? Because from the paradigm follows all the decisions of a government, of corporations, of private and public actors follow that. What has followed the uh, presumption that, uh, that, that the fundamental challenge of agricultural development is the quantity of food produced, right? So that is the underlying assumption. It's certainly the underlying assumption, the United States uh, Agency for International Development, and it is repeatedly the um, explanation that's given to uh, a whole array of, of potential regulators, including in the United States, which I'm most familiar with, also to, the, uh, to regulators in the European Union, and increasingly to developing countries, which are basically following this path which essentially says that um, uh, the five major companies that now dominate the seed and agricultural chemical industries are consolidating at a very rapid rate. I think you're probably aware of this, if you're aware that essentially more than half of the seeds, the little things you put in the, in the ground, um, are now uh, controlled by essentially five companies, European and American companies, which have been merging at a very rapid pace. The interesting thing is the par you're looking for the paradigm, and those, those places you find the paradigm. They tell you the paradigm because whenever they come to a regulating body, and they're the same, re and there are regulating bodies here in South Africa, uh, there are, uh, the African Union is very engaged with this question right now about how much how, how deeply to allow an entrance of the big companies into African countries um, and, of course, in Europe. The basic argument is essentially we're going to allow the consolidation of this industry because it's going to create greater innovation and it's going to produce more food. So how do we as journalists go about probing into this paradigm? Maybe it's true. Maybe, it's, maybe this idea that, there's, that, there, that the question of food is a question purely of quantity, and uh, we have to do everything conceivable within our uh, intelligence to produce as much literal food as we possibly can. Okay, so if you, if you do that, then you're going to have a particular kind of agriculture and a particular kind of aid program. If, however, you begin to actually look and try to see what, that, what follows from that paradigmatic understanding. Let's break out what that means, okay? So, for example, what would be the, uh, your next step? So number one, let's just say your, um, uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, let's just say your um, assumption and the overall paradigm is essentially that the consolidation of, of the seed and chemical industry into a very small number of companies is good because they're going to produce more food, they know how to produce food, they know how to produce massive quantities of seeds, and they know how to produce the chemicals that go with the seeds. So how do we go about probing into whether this is correct or not? What's the first thing you do? Well, I have a few examples here that I just want to point out, and I'm sorry, I need to actually shut yours down and open the other one. <laughs> um, the, um, so maybe, um, no, that's, uh, his thing, so basically, um, there it is, it's right there. Okay, cool, yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so where do you go? So what are your sources? So this is a systematic way, you've, you, you've, uh, if I can actually stress uh, again. Step one, identify the paradigm. Step two, decide if your suspicions and your knowledge are enough to basically begin to probe into the nature of this paradigm. <laughs> Step three, where do you go? What are your sources? You're all journalists, you know how to get your sources, Basically, but I'll just go through a basic kind of rundown. Where number one, what about farmer organizations? What's going to tell you from like farmer organizations may have some very strong opinions about this question about the innovation matter. And I want to um, point out to you, and this is, by the way, a, 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 a pretty interesting uh, example, is uh, a bunch of farmers in the United States uh, were very concerned about 
having less and less choice over the seeds that they could um, use. And um, so a farmer analytics company, what do you want to go to? You want to actually understand farmers need information. Where are they going to get information? They're going to get it from analysis firms, data analysis firms who actually collect stuff that farmers use. You got to think like a farmer in this case. There are many other ways to think, you know, like a public health official. In this case, the, something called the, food, uh, the Farmer Business Network, which is a, uh, a group that's independent of the companies and provides detailed analysis to farmers of, um, of farm conditions and uh, seed performance questions, went out and did a report and they decided to go out and, che and check out how different all the different seeds were of those five companies, right? Five companies sell seeds in the United States and the world, the entire world. This, this study was only limited to the United States, but it could be very useful in your international reporting. So they went out and they, um, whoops, damn, it's a study. Hopefully we'll get it up there. Uh-oh, I got kleptocrat here. I don't know, that's, that's, that's related to all this. Yeah, if you have it. And just to give you a quick summation of this study, I'm just putting the, the cover thing up here and I'll put it on the uh, tip sheets. Um, what they discovered was that actually at least a third of the seeds that were being sold by different companies were actually the same seed. That's, uh, no, that's not me either. I thought I opened that damn thing up. Um, this, this, is, this is the one, yeah, how do we, no, no, this one right here, yeah. I don't know, it's actually the wrong thing is opening up. Huh. Okay, okay, well this, it's possible this may not work, which I don't know why, um, but do, do you know, is the tech person here? Um, anyway, I wanted to kind of turn you on to some actually pretty interesting um, uh, documentation. And this, this particular one is something, and I'll put it on the tip sheets if you're interested and you can come up to me afterward. Uh, it's called the Farmer Business Network. And one of the things they found, and it's worth thinking about if you, all of you are doing development stories particularly here in Africa, this is a big question of how deeply involved the seed companies are. And in, in America, they found that the seeds for main crops, for example, uh, corn and soybeans and other main crops, were the same seeds. That different competing companies were actually selling the same seeds. So farmers thought that they were doing two, three, four different varieties, which is important in a climate-stressed environment to have a diversity of seeds, and suddenly they were planting the same seeds. So if any of you are doing stories on this question here in Africa or anywhere else in the world, uh, I'd be glad to provide you with this report and turn you on to some of the people involved with it. That's one example. Are we, yeah, there we go. Uh-oh, whoo, okay. Well, there's a lot more to talk about, but hopefully we just get to this point of number one, the paradigm, uh, identify how you're gonna go about challenging the paradigm and what it means. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, do you hear me? Okay. Um, well, my name is, hi everyone, it's an honor to be here. My name is Raul Sanchez. Uh, I'm from Spain. Um, I'm here today to present you our last big project, uh, which is the Enslaved Land. Um, Enslaved Land is a uh, one-year project uh, developed by Aldiario.es Newsroom, where I work, and uh, El Faro uh, El Paro, uh, in, Sal in El Salvador, which is a reference for quality journalists and uh, specialized reporters in Latin America. Uh, you, uh, you can see there, the first one is the uh, URL of the project, if you want to search it. It's in Spanish, but you can translate it with Google Translation, and it's, it's pretty okay. And the second one is the URL of the presentation, if you want to see them in your computer. Um, this project, the Slime Land, is a cross-border project on a data-driven investigation uh, that was born from the uh, idea of going deeper into the inequalities between rich uh, and poor countries uh, regarding to crop distribution and resources distribution in the world. Um, I'm sure that most of you have eaten uh, in the past weeks a chocolate bar 
or for example uh, today in the morning uh, you may uh, take a banana for breakfast or maybe you have uh, uh, drank um, coffee a couple of minutes ago. Uh, you may know that if you read the package uh, you can know uh, what are the ingredients of, of these products but um, you certainly don't know where these products came from. Uh, this is um, um, the, the question that this project uh, uh, is trying to answer, this question. Uh, where uh, uh, are these products came from and how they are produced? Um, uh, and a slave land, uh, this investigation comes with a subheading uh, that I think that gets straight to the point. Uh, I read it. Uh, this is how poor countries are used to feed rich countries. Uh, this project involved almost 20 journalists, uh, developers, designers uh, to unveil the hidden sites uh, of agri-industry and the plantations uh, economy in developing countries. Um, when we are talking about this uh, plantations economy, we are talking about a monoculture agricultural model that usually um, needs uh, big land areas, uh, usually needs uh, cheap labor, uh, usually needs a tropical climate, and the most important thing for me, uh, this uh, agricultural model uh, was born in the colonies uh, four centuries ago. Um, in this project, uh, we talk um, about uh, five crops that are widely consumed in Europe and also the United States uh, in four different countries. These crops are uh, coffee, banana, sugar, cocoa, and African palm. And we reported in countries like in these countries, in Colombia, Guatemala, Ivory Coast, and Honduras. Three from Latin America and one from Africa. Um, we try to, uh, this investigation try to uh, focus or try to uh, focus the story of this investigation in three different ideas. Uh, the first one is uh, how are laboral conditions uh, in these plantations? Uh, um, how much uh, do uh, the workers of these plantations earn? Um, how many hours uh, are they working every day? Um, also, if there is uh, child labor in these plantations. Uh, the second one is about the, mm, the corporate concentration. It's about how um, uh, we want, uh, we ask uh, if there's a concentration of the profits. Uh, of this business in a small group of companies or a small group of families or a group uh, or a small group of multinationals. And uh, the third one is that um, uh, if this plantation model uh, causes environmental damages uh, to the countries where uh, they are planted or where they, are, or where they farm. Um, after one year uh, investigation, uh, we uh, uh, discovered that all these statements were true, that uh, this, all these plantations, uh, this uh, agricultural model, uh, is, based, is based on uh, exploitative, in most cases, slave-like um, condition for workers, also for illegal, illegal uh, business practices, or the, how uh, there's a, so much concentration of the business in a little group of hands, and um, also that there's a sustained uh, environmental damages of all of these plantations. Um, what do we revealed? Uh, for example, we proved with data that the, this, the main statement of this investigation, uh, how to plant in poor countries to feed Western uh, rich countries, uh, with the United Nations international trade data. Uh, this is the data visualization that uh, explains this. The size of the, I don't see if you see the orange, well, the, the orange uh, bubbles uh, measure the um, size of the exports, and the uh, um, green ones measure the size of the exports. So in this data visualization, you, you will see, for example, how the coffee international trade flow is from countries like Colombia, Brazil, uh, Peru, Guatemala, Honduras, uh, Ethiopia, Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, to the well, within the rich countries like uh, Italy, Spain, France, uh, Germany, Belgium, uh, the United States. Uh, we proved with this uh, investigation that uh, this was the um, the same model for all crops that we investigated, um, and we published five different stories. 
uh, one is for each country and for each crop. Um, the first one uh, that I want to explain to you is this one. Uh, we um, investigated the sugar industry in Guatemala, in Central America, and we revealed that uh, seven uh, barren families, seven wealthy families of Guatemala, uh, control 90% of uh, sugar production for more uh, than 30 years. Uh, and also we proved that uh, this uh, um, uh, that this um, this industry, that how these families uh, created a sugar cartel like the uh, drug one, um, who that controlled prices, uh, block imports, uh, remove the competitors, or uh, use a technique of uh, market sharing to uh, use uh, um, to share the market of the sugar in Guatemala. Uh, uh, I give you a data. The same uh, uh, families that control 90% of, um, sh uh, of sugar production in Guatemala in 1983 were the same that currently uh, are producing the 90% of sugar uh, of sugar production in Guatemala. Um, we also proved that um, this uh, this industry, these sugar families. Uh, created an offshore uh, companies network to uh, avoid uh, the control of the government about the taxes. He uh, used uh, these uh, offshore companies to export their production uh, to other countries. Um, to publish this story, um, we dive into uh, lots of public records. We uh, sent public information requests. We analyzed uh, United Nations uh, international trade data. Um, we also use uh, satellite uh, images, uh, but I think that what was most important uh, for this story is that we created um, uh, social ne well, social network. No, it's like a um, database network of who are the owners, uh, who and how they are connected to offshore companies all around the world. So. Uh, we created, uh, this one is, an, uh, you see that, it's an example of the network we created, uh, to know who are the owners of these sugar mills in Guatemala and how they are connected to offshore companies. We look for uh, uh, company re uh, registrations in uh, Panama, Virgin Islands, and so in, um, international databases. And we proved that 10 of the 12 uh, sugar mills uh, that, that are currently in Guatemala uh, were linked to offshore companies in tax havens like Panama, Virgin Islands, or Bahamas. Uh, on another story that uh, we published in this project is um, um, uh, how a large part of uh, the lands of the banana corporations in uh, Colombia are still in, dis in dispute uh, right now. Uh, thousands of um, Thousands of farmers uh, are still waiting for a court resolution uh, that allows them to recover the land that was stolen uh, by the banana corporations in Colombia in an alliance with the paramilitary groups. So what happened in Colombia in the, um, in the armed conflict uh, late 90s and the start of the uh, 21st century uh, is that uh, uh, banana corporations hired paramilitary groups uh, for uh, security services, but in fact, um, they use this parliamentary group uh, to displace people from the land and steal that land. So this is um, what we rebelled. And also, um, we rebelled the uh, big concentration of, uh, of the banana industry in Colombia in a uh, small group of hands. Uh, in this case, for example, uh, I give you data, uh, two companies uh, this one, Univan um, Banacle, uh, exported 60% uh, of banana production that left Colombian ports uh, and, uh, between uh, 2008 and 2015. Uh, how we do this story? Um, uh, we, uh, of course, use all these data, uh, data sources uh, like core censuses, public records, agricultural census, uh, company registries. Uh, mm, but one of the most important thing this is how do you, uh, how do uh, we use data? Uh, we discovered that the Colombian municipality, uh, with more requests uh, for land restitution, um, was also the one with uh, the most banana land area. So 
uh, when we uh, di figure, uh, discovered this, uh, we reported the story in the ground, and we found in that municipality that there were dozens of histories of farmers uh, that they were threatened by paramilitar paramilitary groups to, uh, to go to other side and leave their land. In Honduras, we talk about the palm oil, uh, the palm oil, palm oil industry. Uh, we reveal how the uncontrolled uh, promotion of African palm uh, by the Honduras government is destroying the uh, country's forest and natural areas of the country. Uh, this investigation showed uh, there are um, more than uh, 7,000 hectares of palm oil plantations uh, in protected areas of the country. This one, uh, I remember if you don't know that uh, Honduras is the uh, dangerous, uh, the most uh, classified as the most dangerous uh, country for environmental def uh, defenders. And all these uh, um, damages to the environment in Honduras, um, it's for the profit of two companies because two companies, we discovered with this investigation that two companies, uh, uh, Dinant, Dinant Group and Harema Group, control half of the palm oil production in Honduras. This the same as we found in uh, we find in in Colombia. Um, uh, we use, well, as I said before, a lot of uh, data resources, uh, data sources. But um, you know, Duras, I think the key the key of this investigation was using the uh, geographic information and uh, satellite uh, imagery to find and to tell the story. Um, in this case, we compiled um, uh, all land use data from all municipalities from Honduras, and we compiled it in one file to discover where are um, the palm oil plantations in all the country, and then we match uh, that uh, geographical information with the protected area. So uh, with that, we can uh, uh, search exactly where um, are these uh, palm oil plantations in national parks or protected areas. For example, uh, the main story of, uh, of this investigation uh, was the story of Janet Cowes Park, which is a national park uh, whose name is coming from an environmental defender who uh, was opposed to the uh, palm oil plantations in natural areas of Honduras. Um, and also, the last story uh, I want to tell you today, um, um, we rebuild the conditions, uh, the labor condition, which 40% of uh, world cocoa uh, is produced uh, behind the chocolate industry that generates millions, uh, billions worldwide. Uh, thousands of cocoa growers uh, live in misery uh, in Ivory Coast, and there's, uh, there's still a problem of child labor uh, in these plantations. Um, Although um, the chocolate multinationals promised uh, to invest more than $20 million uh, to combat child labor and the situation of, uh, of these people, of these farmers, uh, these funds didn't uh, mm, resolve the problem because uh, they were talking about, mm, they didn't, uh, they didn't uh, resolve the main issue uh, of this problem, is the poverty uh, and the lack of opportunities of, of, of the farmers. Uh, for example, for this story, um, uh, we collected data from a uh, lot of sources, for example, for uh, chocolate companies uh, about their investments to reduce child, child labor in the country. Uh, also, we analyzed financial statements of chocolate companies. Uh, we look at U.S. government data and also uh, data from universities. But the problem with uh, this, uh, when we, uh, we were reporting and we were um, working on this story, is that um, there were no public data in Ivory Coast about this issue. Um, I mean, uh, even the U.S. government have more data about the chocolate, uh, the cocoa uh, plantations in Ivory Coast than the local government of Ivory Coast. Uh, that um, is why uh, one of the um, many ideas that we uh, uh, talk in this, uh, that we uh, told in this, uh, in this story, is um, 
how um, is that the Ivory government uh, doesn't know how many children are working in the uh, Cocoa uh, Ivory Coast Plantation, or uh, how many people uh, are living by uh, Cocoa industry in Ivory Coast, or even where are these plantations located? So we have to face this lack of public data, this uh, lack of data, and for, for example, uh, we face this with uh, what we call uh, like traditional investigative journalism work is uh, going to uh, going to the uh, to the places where are the plant well, where are the plantations and uh, talking to the people uh, going to the projects that um, the chocolate companies uh, investment and uh, that's what we do in Ivory Coast and. Um, what we learn from this project, from uh, talking about uh, developing issues and how to do an investigative project uh, like this in developing countries. Um, the first one is that you know have uh, do you know do you have to know that there are a lot of difficulties uh, of covering rural zones in in these kind of countries because. Uh, as I said, for example, with the, uh, the story about uh, cocoa and Ivory Coast, uh, in most cases there's a absolute lack of data. We have no data. We have no information about uh, the more basic information about this, and um, also because there is, in most cases, there is no presence of the government. No, there is no presence of the state. So uh, uh, there are. A lot of uh, areas that is um, a bit dangerous to report. For example, uh, we were lucky to uh, work with El Faro uh, because they know, for example, Honduras, one of the dangerous uh, countries in the world, uh, to because they know the, uh, how to uh, how to face with this uh, this kind of reporting, and also even these kind of things, uh, even arriving at the place where the story is. It's really complicated, and when you are trying to uh, report stories, uh, stories about uh, agriculture and, and crops. Um, the second uh, thing that we learn is that in this, in this investigation, it's, I think it's really important to improve our investigation with uh, databases, with data. Uh, in, in this case, for example, uh, we select the countries we are uh, going to report, uh, the crops we are going to report, uh, doing, a f uh, doing first an uh, analysis, uh, that analysis of uh, international trade data of the United Nations. Um, also because mm, in most cases it helps you not only to find the story but, only to find, but also to find um, the place where uh, you, uh, you must go to, to report the story. For example, um, in Honduras, uh, our reporter Nelson Rauda uh, knew that he had to go to an excellent place because we, ha we had uh, an excellent map of where are all uh, palm oil plantations uh, in the country. So uh, don't, uh, I encourage you to use that as use data to um, uh, improve your investigation, to improve your uh, investigative reporting uh, projects, because it helps you to find better stories and, and, to, uh, and to prove uh, all your hypotheses. Um, the third one is, uh, is, of course, it's really important, uh, I'm finishing, uh, of course, it's, it's really important uh, what we are telling, uh, what are the um, findings of the investigation, but it's also important uh, how do you uh, publish this investigation. In this case, we try to uh, innovate uh, using a long-form story uh, that were mixed with uh, maps, uh, photographs, uh, data visualizations, and for example, in the main web page, uh, you can see uh, our, mm, a summary of the investigation that uh, and we uh, use um, GIFs to uh, to explain uh, what we are uh, what we are telling. Um, and the final one, um, I think, is very important. Um, it's uh, I think, uh, for example, this is an example of how to do an investigative uh, journalism project with. 
uh, open source. We all know about, for example, Panama Papers, we, uh, the data comes from, uh, from a leak, but uh, for example, this investigation uh, was made from data coming from uh, sources that mm, every of you can uh, can be accessed uh, free uh, sources of uh, open register companies, international trade data, uh, also public uh, records from the or from each government. Uh, what I mean is that um, it's uh, it's really e well easy. Um, we can do uh, investigations with data using only public data sources. Uh, I think this is a great part of uh, do s using data in, in this kind of project. And yeah, uh, the last uh, third second, this is uh, an example of the tools uh, we use to, uh, we use in, in this project. Uh, for example, we use Excel, SPSS, and Tableau for data analysis. We use Kimono uh, for web scrapping, open Refire from for uh, data cleaning. Uh, Kuji and Carto for uh, uh, geographical analysis and maps, uh, Illustrator for data visualization, and Kum One Another, which are, I think are uh, cool tools for um, uh, network uh, uh, databases analysis. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. We do have some time left for questions. Uh, there's some uh, mics going around here, so. Any questions? Oh, come on. It's not that late in the day. <laughs> um, OK, if there's no question, I'll start with one. Um, uh, oh, there's one. Yeah. You get the microphone. Yeah. Um, no, th first of all, that's, uh, yeah. Uh, well, her question was, the way I, I was approaching it was sounded kind of somewhat academic, um, which, uh, and, and where do I publish the material? So um, the, um, I'm mostly a magazine writer, so I write for different magazines, monthlies and stuff, so they are long form stories. And, uh, and then in books. But I think the main, uh, what's at the root of your question is this kind of idea that um, somehow understanding the overall system at work is somehow an academic question. But actually, by understanding the, the way the system works, number one, you have to understand as a journalist what the uh, uh, underlying paradigm, where it leads, it leads to a whole array of decisions, and um, how you can go about challenging it. So what I didn't get a chance to kind of continue with was all the kind of evidence that is hanging out there, and almost in plain sight, hidden in plain sight, and you only find it when you begin to ask the right questions. And you ask the question that does, does, uh, does, does um, the consolidation of the seed industry lead to innovation? Well, you go to industry sources and you start realizing maybe it doesn't because there are a lot of people in the industry who are complaining about this. Does, is the factor of food, is, is, is the question of, um, of, of food of, of a question of quantity? And uh, you go, well, that's a huge question. And then it turns out that there's the United Nations and many other sort of non, uh, uh, independent bodies which are saying that is not the question. It's the quantity of food. The question, of course, is distribution. And distribution uh, from there follows numerous things. So when you are doing stories about companies, which is what I do, um, you try to actually understand what their argument is, analyze their argument, and then go around finding systematic ways to actually test whether that argument holds up, and then write about it. So this is not an academic, could, I suppose it could be academic. It, I don't think of it as academic at all. It's a, but it is a scientific way of thinking. It's, 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 that's why I, I, I tip my hat to this, the scientific method applies to us journalists as much as it does to scientists, just to make it clear. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, my name is Tao George. I'm from Nigeria. Uh, the, the question is for the editor of Punch. Now, I want to ask, how do you determine the success of a story? I ask this because of, uh, in the course of your presentation, 
you cited, um, you made reference to um, using pictures for development stories. And there was, a, there was an instance when the government acted after the story was, the picture was published. Now, in the case where the authority refuses to act, does it mean that the essence has been defeated, that the story is not successful? Then what does the journalist do in that case? Yeah, I think that the success of a story, first of all, is in telling the story. Because most of these development stories affect people that don't have a voice. So the very fact that you're giving a voice to their predicament or their sufferings or their own development is a major success by itself. Um, I think that the action on whatever story or photo you use is just the icing on the cake. The real cake is the fact that those people have a voice and a platform. Um, so what do you do when you do a story and there's no action from the government? Then you do another story. You do a follow-up story and you keep applying the pressure until they act. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my name's Toby McIntosh. I'm with the GIJN, and I'm, I, since I'm in Washington, I, I've looked a lot at World Bank things, and I'm, I'm wondering how you connect all the things that you find in your reporting with sort of the larger policies that might be underlying or maybe causal in, or not causal <laughs> in solving the problems, and whether that's um, uh, something that's that's uh, you find difficult or. Um, uh, well, I'll let, leave it at that. Yeah. Very good, good question. And um, I have an example. I remember when the WHO came out with the polio statistics, talking about why Nigeria was still battling with polio. And, uh, and one of the stories we did, we did several stories on polio, was to look at government policy. How come we received hundreds of millions of don dollars from donor agencies to tackle polio? and we still have not been able to find a solution despite all policies. So we looked at government policies and then we started asking experts, why are these policies not working? So apart from telling the story, as you rightly said, these statistics also force us to put government on its toes to revisit its policies. And what happened after the polio story was government had to find um, a different policy to tackle the polio issue because they realized that the old policies were not working. And um, I, I think that is what development stories do. Apart from giving a face, it also forces governments to change policies where necessary. I hope I answered your question. You did, and I think you connected the dot with what Mark is, is saying too because you're, you're on the ground so you, you, you yeah. find the, the fault in whatever was the underlying assumption of that policy. Yeah, and, 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 apart from, and apart from policy, um, another thing these figures do um, is that it also brings out corruption, the issues of corruption, right? So sometimes you could even say, um, how much has UNESCO, how much has WU, how much has the United Nations given Nigeria, for example, to battle HIV? So in the past 10 years, we've received this amount of money. Then how come we have more people living with HIV? And we've... We have the numbers of people living with HIV is increasing, and we're spending all this money, so where is it going to? So another thing it does is to expose, expose corruption, apart from also looking at policy. Um, thanks for the great uh, presentation. I am Pascal from South Sudan. Uh, my question or concern basically goes to my sister from Nigeria. Um, in South Sudan, something like that, like the presentations that you just presented, uh, where you bring the, the concern of the people, maybe the, the human interest stories from the grassroots level and put it at the front page. And writing maybe the headlines, again, as the government, the government will come for, will shut your newspaper or your radio station or your media house the following day. That happened like two months ago. Two newspapers uh, printed something contradicting with, with the government, like something they did not like. And they, had, they, they went in the middle of the night to the printing company and ensured that the following day the, the story did not appear in the newspaper. So my question or concern is, someone who is from a country where the print or the, I mean the, the media is being controlled by the government, if I happen or my media house happened to print out something like that, how would you take it or how, how will you handle it? because we are, we are really battling with this. 
Thank you for that question, and I quite sympathize with the, with the Sudan situation, which many of us in this room are very familiar with. As you said, um, development stories also expose government lies. We use it all the time. Government says we built 50 schools in this community. You go to that area, you take pictures of just one school and say, look, we just found one school. How come you said you built 50 schools? So what happens when you do that? And then government comes after you. Um, in that case, survival is very, very paramount. And if you are not alive to tell the story, then um, then there's no point. Um, and what I'll suggest, I don't know your situation very well, as, as well as you do, is um, to find um, people to collaborate with, right? So are there other um, unknown people in your country that operate blogs that p um, government will see and people will see, can you use bloggers to tell your story? Can you use the international community, collaborations with um, other journalists in, in countries that report Sudan to tell the same story. So it's not coming from you. You're pushing the story out. Um, and, and I think it's going to achieve the same thing. Government sees it, but they can't do anything about it um, because it's coming from someone or some people they can't reach. So I'll, I'll suggest you, you use anonymous bloggers and you also use the international community. Um, I'd, I'll suggest also that you um, use this opportunity to find out um, agencies that are present at this event who are also interested in publishing stories that you can't publish in your media house because of fear of persecution. Okay, we have about four more minutes. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, if there's any question. Um, are you all satisfied? You can, of course, come and talk to our panelists as well, uh, but I think they're a bit eager to clear the room because they're gonna have a meeting, uh, a board meeting. So, um, for the rest of you, it's a wrap. <laughs> so, thank you. And, and Again, here are a panel of big applause.